The civil war was over. People tried to rebuild their lives, but the economy was in tatters. Flyaway inflation meant money was worthless. In the cities, the working class disappeared as people went home to their villages. To keep the cities from starving, iron detachments of party activists arrived in the countryside. They'd changed their party's name from Bolshevik to communist. So the Bolsheviks, who promised land to the peasants, were now communists, taking their food by force. The villages did not submit without a struggle. There were times of real hunger. All our food had gone. Anybody who had any grain left hid it away in the wood. They'd found out that grain requisitioning had already got to neighboring villages. Thousands of party people were set upon and killed by roaming bands of vengeful peasants. Lenin said, we are barely holding on. Every Saturday and Sunday we were out on grain requisitions, searching out stores of food. The local party representative had set out to meet us when he was ambushed. They killed him, stole all his papers and let his horse go. The horse turned up carrying his dead body. Years of war and requisitioning, then a terrible drought. This train evacuated 400 starving children from the Volga. These were the lucky ones. The famine killed five million. The new economic policy, or NEP, was a welcome release from ration cards and requisitioning. But to many communists, NEP brought back the bad old days. There wasn't a scrap of food in the country. We were down to a quarter pound of bread per person. Then, suddenly they announced NEP. Cafes started opening, restaurants. Factories went back into private hands. It was capitalism. The papers were all quoting Lenin. Two steps forward, one step back. That's all very well, but in my eyes, what was happening was the very thing I'd struggled against. I can remember the years 1921, 1922. We used to discuss the new economic policy for hours on end at party meetings. Most people supported Lenin. Others said he was wrong. Many even tore up their party cards. NEP was a sensible response to Lenin's economic difficulties. It didn't owe much to Karl Marx. According to him, socialism simply couldn't apply to a backward economy like Russia's. In any case, the revolution had to be international. Marx gave no clues about what to do if you found yourself all on your own trying out socialism in one poor, backward, chaotic country. I got there and found all my party comrades already gathered. Some sort of secretary appeared. He seemed very upset about something. We all thought it was because he was ill. He went out, but after a couple of minutes he came back in. He said, comrades, and fell silent. There were tears in his eyes. We didn't understand anything until... Finally, he said it. Lenin is dead. We were so shaken by it, we couldn't speak. Just sat there, couldn't move from the room. Somehow we knew that at that moment we all needed each other. Lenin suffered a third and final stroke at his country house on the 21st of January 1924. Hundreds of local people accompanied his coffin as it began the journey to Moscow.
такой мороз. Страшнейший. It was such bitter weather. Everybody froze, but they still queued to pay their last respects to Lenin. That's how much they loved this man, this leader. It never occurred to me that anybody could take Lenin's place. There was a slogan printed in the papers. Lenin can only be replaced by the collective will of the party. More than anything, we were frightened of Trotsky seizing power. Although now we know that that wasn't the main problem. In those days, Stalin was an unknown figure to us. People hadn't heard of him. I worked in the Kremlin, and I didn't know who Stalin was. And I was a Red Commander. The tractor factory at Chelyabinsk in Siberia. A showpiece of Stalin's plan to modernize the Soviet Union. The coming of the Chelyabinsk factory changed the life of Elena Pirzhogina. I told Dad I'm off to join the tractor factory. Where did you dream that one up, he said. Finish school like everyone else. Look, it's in all the papers. They're building an enormous factory. Over the next 10 years, 17 million peasants, more than 10% of the Soviet population, moved from the land to new industrial cities like Chelyabinsk. So we went off to find the boss of the site. He signed us up and explained, you're going to be working on the foundations. See that mountain of earth over there? Well, the horses and carts are bringing it in, and the sand too, and you're going to wheel it round in barrows. How does that sound? I'll do it, I said. I'll do everything. Red Army officer Mark Makagoon went to Chelyabinsk to lead the novice workers. What can I say? It was chaos. It was misery, happiness and fear. Some were frightened of the machines. When you looked up at them sometimes, they seemed as big as a two- or three-story house. But we kept going, kept at it. And most important of all, we didn't lose heart. Engineer Nikolai Bielov came from Moscow to help train the raw workforce. They broke the machinery out of inexperience, even ran away from work. But we carried on, persisted, believed in what we were doing. And on the 31st of June, 1933, the factory began production. The first tractor came off the line, and on it rode Mark Makagun. Mark Makagun. Everybody who'd made a part of the tractor, no matter how small, was so excited about it. Where have they put it? They ran up to have a look. Oh, that's my bit. There's my part. There was such joy, I can't tell you. There were tears of joy. Mark Makagun paraded the first tractor around Chelyabinsk. As we rode along, the old peasants were crossing themselves. Lord, save us. Others just fled from the noise. It was a miracle in those days, you see. A living miracle. Toolmaker Robert Robinson escaped the racism and unemployment of Detroit for a contract in the workers' paradise. I never saw a people who were so imbued with the fact that they were going in five years' time, at most, Stalin told them, seven years' time, to overtake and surpass the United States of America. The people were simply, in fact, they would come six o'clock in the morning instead of 7.30 and begin to work the machines. And when the second shift would come, they wouldn't let them work on the machine. They wanted to continue. Two American trade unionists, Victor and Walter Ruther, came for adventure. 
it was an exciting experience to see people with uh, such uh, minimal technical experience coming out of Central Asia or out of a Volga farm village and getting a job in a factory that is making automobiles that run, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is a whole new world. It was an exciting experience for them and for us to be a part of it. The Moscow Metro was begun during the first five-year plan. Its builders were the stars of the Soviet workforce. Their faces adorned posters. Their exploits filled the newsreels. This young woman was one of the heroines of the Metro construction. They sent me to work on access shaft number 3132. So I got there and began to look for the entrance. Nowhere to be seen. There were trams running up and down the road, tram tracks too, but no shaft. Ah yes, the shaft, they said. You're going to build it. So we had to pull up all the tram tracks, build a fence around the site, and clear away all the stones with our metal spades. Then, and only then, did we actually start work on the metro itself. The first seven miles of line were opened on the 15th of May 1935. Stalin congratulated its builders. We got so dirty, and we were such young things, small, slender, fragile. But we had our orders to build the metro, and we wanted to do it more than anything else. We wore our overalls with such chic, and those rubber hats, we set them on our heads, cowboy style. And then there were the boots, huge boots. My feet were size four, and the boots were 11s. The image of peasant and worker united is an enduring symbol of the Soviet Revolution. The Russian word for it is smuichka, which suggests the closest of bonds. In reality, the political leadership despised the peasants for their backwardness and feared them as potential enemies of the revolution. Pinchuki is a small village in the Ukraine, agricultural heartland of the Soviet Union. Father would wake us before dawn. So by five or six in the morning, we were already up and about. And then all day until late in the evening, until darkness fell, we'd be working in the fields or doing something around the farm or catching fish for supper. And that was how our family worked, flat out. That was how we managed to build up our little farm. And we had the best kept farm in the village. Stalin believed these more prosperous peasants stood in the way of his plans for the countryside. They were called kulaks. The party was mobilized against the kulaks. Even its youngest members, the pioneers, joined the propaganda campaign. We used to go to young pioneer summer camp to the village, and that was my first contact really with peasants. I didn't know them. And I couldn't understand why they were so glum, and they seemed to hate us. The harvest was very good, but we couldn't collect it because there weren't enough sacks. So we were sent to the village to go to every house and ask them to give up their sacks. And some did and some didn't. And those that didn't, we just put down in our round school children's uh, handwriting, he must be a kulak. In every village, activists like Stepan Olyenik in Pinchuki were mobilized against the kulaks. I was already head of the village committee at the time and a candidate to the party. They just decided one day that this and that family didn't fit in. They had huge grain taxes slapped on them. We'd say, not going to pay it? Right then. And that was it. They were labelled kulaks. 
What did they do to us? They threw us out of our house, confiscated everything those party people did. They said they were building socialism, so they robbed us of everything and created their socialism. So we set to and dekulakized 70 families, deported the lot. After that, we went round a second and third time, but this time we rounded up less, about 30 families. That was because our orders for Pinchuki were to dekulakize and exile a hundred families. The whole thing was a complete tragedy. The work of a hundred years was destroyed. That's how you should look at it. Totally destroyed. Men, women, children, the elderly, all were deported. Loaded onto cattle cars, they were transported for thousands of miles to the frozen Arctic, the steppes of Central Asia, the wastes of Siberia to join the growing army of slave laborers. Few survived. We organized the rest of the Bapinchuki into a collective as well, so by 1929 we had three collective farms going. They were called Socialism Reconstructed, Ready Air of Wheat and Komsomol. We had a slogan, Defend Collectivization, Liquidate the Kulaks. On Soviet cinema screens, peasants marched off happily to join the collective farms and begin a new life as willing servants of the plan. So they went through the village in alphabetical order, making sure that everybody registered for the collective farm. Nobody wanted to register, so we asked if we could think it over for two or three days. Just think it over. Well, during the nights we were supposed to be sleepy on it, we went out and destroyed our livestock. In 1932, writer Lev Kopelyev joined a requisitioning brigade in the Ukraine. You see, it was daylight robbery. But we convinced ourselves that this was for our country, that this was a fight for bread, a fight for socialism. In Pinchuki, the new year, 1933, saw people starting to die. In the Ukraine, the famine claimed more than five million lives. Hunger drove the survivors to the edge of sanity. In Pinchuki, Olya Treshenko went out to look for food. When she returned, her child had disappeared. I went looking for him everywhere. I ran round for two days. Then in the garden, in my neighbor's garden, I found his little head. Nobody said anything or did anything. I went off to the village Soviet. They said there was nothing they could do, nothing. The teacher's guide for the first six weeks of this term contains material for both Russia, Revolution and Empire, and migration.